Hi, this is Ina Langerman from Violina.live, helping you along your musical journey. In this video, I'm going to share with you five tips on how to practice large shifts that also go across strings. These are generally very difficult and can be quite intimidating to tackle. So hopefully some of these ideas will help to make large shifts more manageable for you and maybe you'll even be excited to practice them. Tip number one is to create a reference point. And a lot of times this is gonna be a note that's not written in the music. So what we wanna do is to break down the shift into an easier component and make everything on the same string. This is going to identify the shifting interval versus the interval that we're, we are hearing. Those are two completely different things. So a great example, prime example, is the famous opening to the cadenza of the Sibelius uh, violin concerto. We have to make this large leap, B flat to B flat, going three octaves up now it may seem like a really scary shift but if we break it down what can we see this also depends on what fingering you like to do for this for me it's easiest to start actually in second position so the low b flat will be on the first finger um, that way what happens why am i doing it this way well i want my top note to be on my third finger and if i start in first uh on the first finger in second position and uh, what I'm going to do is see where I am on the E string. On the E string, my reference point is going to be my third finger, which is another B flat. What does that mean? That means that the shifting interval, not the one we're hearing, is one octave. What we're hearing is a three octave leap, but the actual shift is one octave if I do it this way, third finger to third finger, B flat to B flat. So this is the shift I'm really gonna practice a lot. And actually, this is a great reason to practice octave shifts with all the fingers and different parts of the instrument. That way when you encounter something like this, oh, it's just a one octave shift. Now, that doesn't mean this is an easy, uh, opening the cadence, it really is not. It's much more challenging. When you practice octave shifts, just outside of repertoire, what happens is you start to develop a, more and more over time, a sense of trust, how these kind of shifts feel, how what the distance is. And what happens is a lot of performers, um, they're not going to, they're not gonna, they're not gonna actually play their reference note in performance. For practice, I would, I would actually include it. But eventually we have to start going up without the third finger down right away. So what do I do instead? And I talked a little bit about this in my video on shifting through open strings. Um, I'm gonna use the side of my uh, first finger, the bass, that's making a contact with the neck. That's gonna help me to sense the distance and on the way up, my third finger is going to touch the E string at some point, not right away, but we want to have some kind of information, even if my bow leaves the string. So if, even if I go, even if I go like this and my bow did not connect like that, there was always something um, touching the fingerboard whether it's the base of the first finger or the third finger, because in high positions, I do have to remove the base of the first finger. At this point, the third finger must be down by then. One reference point that's very helpful to become familiar with on our instrument in general, it's the middle harmonics. So we want to practice hitting them out of nowhere in, uh, let's say I put my hand down, and I try to find that middle harmonic on different strings and different fingers. Now, third and fourth finger are a little easier to find, but I know that for me, second and first finger, I would need to practice this more. And actually, those are very helpful ones to practice because they're going to help you uh, increase your chances of landing sixth and seventh positions in tune. So let's say I wanna land with my second finger. Do it a little better. That was better. Now I'll try it with my first finger. 
So this is very helpful if you have to go to sixth or seventh position from the first position, for example, and you have to kind of jump up pretty high. So knowing where those harmonics are is very helpful. Tip number two is finger before bow. So a lot of people get confused. What do I do first? Do I shift first? Do I move the bow first? Do I shift on the old string? Do I shift on the new string? How do I coordinate all of this? And it really depends on the repertoire in question. Most of the time, the finger will go before the bow. So how to break down uh, these kind of shifts that go across strings? Here's a great way to practice it. And that is to, let's say, you play something on the G string, and then you have to go up on the E string and you have to play in a higher position. So play the last note on the, the previous string, then freeze with the bow, do not move the bow, move the left hand to where it needs to go, wherever that may be, and after that, you move the bow to the new string, to the new note. And that's when, of course, there is some sense of trust that's involved. Um, it's important to practice other kind of shifts in order to play passages like this. Now, of course, like I said, it depends on the repertoire. So let's say in the Sibelius example, you want to add a glissando on, on the way up to the high B flat. In that case, you would cross over with the bow a little bit before hitting the top B flat. To demonstrate practicing in this method, I'm going to use a piece that I'm currently working on. I'm working on Prokofiev's second violin concerto because I do have to perform it about a month from the time I'm filming this video. So in the middle of the second movement, there is a passage that does exactly that. It goes back and forth between G and E strings and switching positions pretty rapidly. <laughs> So something like that. So how would I practice this passage? Here is a great way. Start, so we start in fifth position here. Leave the bow. Left hand moves to uh, first finger on C, on the G string. Move the bow. Freeze with the bow, move, don't move it. Left hand goes to B flat on the E string, fourth position. Move the bow. Left hand ready. Left hand ready. Move the bow. Left hand ready. Left hand ready. Then bow. Left hand. Left hand. You see what I'm doing? Left hand first, bow crosses after. So this will help to coordinate it. So many, many times to just play it like this. That's one way to practice something like this. Another example, uh, I won't demonstrate it today because I haven't played it in years, like more than 10 years. Uh, Paganini's Ninth Caprice, the middle section, something very, very similar to this. I would practice it the exact same way. Tip number three is more general and it's for any kind of shift. And that is to avoid jerky movement with the left hand and try not to hop around suddenly because that's greatly going to impact accuracy. Even if a shift is fast, we still want to create some kind of smoothness so that we sense the path and all the things that happen in between the notes. That's what's going to determine the result. So just like basic things about life, you know, we want to set goals for ourselves and we want to know what those goals are, but we can't stay so fixated on them that we get obsessed because if we do that, we're just going to miss out on all the little steps that we're supposed to do in order to give ourselves even a chance of reaching that goal. So the idea generally is focus on the journey. I talk about the musical journey all the time. We focus more on the journey than the goal um, will take care of itself or it'll give you a chance of getting there. So the same thing with shifting, really. Focus more on the in-betweens, everything that's happening that's going to really help to improve your shifts. By the way, if you're getting any value so far, I would greatly appreciate if you could give this video a thumbs up so that YouTube shows it to more people who really need it. Tip number four, one of my favorites, and that is to anticipate. And what I mean is anticipate with my elbow. Actually, this motion the swinging motion comes from the shoulder. So don't get confused and think that you have to move the forearm around because that's incorrect. It has to be the entire arm it has to swing to the right. So we do this right before shifting upwards. Let's say, for example, going back to the octave shift we were talking about earlier. 
If I do it normally, this is what's going to be my octave shift. Those B flats. But if I anticipate with my arm and do this first in the middle of playing the low one, it actually makes that large shift feel so much smaller. It makes that distance feel short. So what we do is we eliminate the extra step of coming around the instrument with our thumb, with our arm, because if we do it while we're shifting, it's going to make that shift feel so large and there's gonna be less of a chance we're gonna quite make it all the way to the top. It's gonna make it a little bit scarier. So similarly, shifting downward, I'll bring my arm a little to the left and maybe I'll even move my instrument a little bit to the left. I, I like for my instrument to be able to move around a little bit. So notice that I went like this and then like this. So elbow first, arm first, then shift, then going down that way and then shift. That makes it so much smoother. This works with small shifts as well. Let's say if you want to make first to third position feel even smoother. Want to make this feel smoother. Anticipate. So much easier. Now the good news is if you are going from the G string in low positions going straight to the high positions on the E string, just like in both examples I showed earlier, this step of anticipating, you don't really need to do it because while you're on the lowest string, your elbow is probably already in the correct position uh, for that wind up, if you can want to call it that. Tip number five is something that's easier for some than others, and that is to use the thumb as a pivot. So what we do, and we do it outside of repertoire, is we work on the flexibility of the backward extension especially. We work on the flexibility. How far can the four fingers, the rest of the hand go opposite of the thumb? So we kind of almost isolate the thumb from everything else and kind of develop this motion. So let's say, for example, I put my thumb somewhere around third or fourth position and I want to see how far back I can reach my fingers. Not just the first finger, but if I put all four fingers on the fingerboard, how far back can I move back? Now, this can be very challenging for intonation um, in the low positions, especially for people with small hands and short fingers. However, I think for everybody, this is a very important thing to practice because it can save unnecessary extra movement in fast passages. This is sometimes, in certain cases, the only thing that can make some of these passages even playable. Uh, this can be done to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the individual player and the passage in question. And of course, it also won't work in every situation because sometimes doing extensions for too much, it can create a lot of tension. So we have to take that into account as well. Sometimes there is literally no time to complete a shift especially when we have to go back where we came from right away. So one example of this, and this is a piece I haven't played in, a, in years, toward the end of Sanson introduction Ronda Capriccioso, we have four octave arpeggios and all of them are ascending. So we essentially go from, like there's an A major arpeggio, and we have it twice and then it goes to B flat. However, those are played super fast. I probably won't get them in tempo for you in this video, but here's what we need to do for, to practice that one. What we don't want to do is start with our thumb all the way back here. It works it's, if it's slow, right? But when we go fast, we want to see how little we can move our thumb while keeping it mobile, right? So this time I moved my thumb much less. I went like this and like this again, instead of going like that, because there's no time in tempo to go all the way back. So going back to the Prokofiev example, here's how you can practice with the pivoting of the thumb. So starting in fifth position, third position, fourth position, first position, I'll leave the thumb. So I left the thumb so that I can pivot here also 
I'll move it a little bit, but not too much. So the reason I'm not moving it too much is I know that I'm going to go to first position and straight to fourth after this. And then from fourth, I'm going to leave it here. So a lot of it, um, for a lot of these examples, I noticed that putting the thumb right around here, third and fourth position, is a great place to pivot. Again, it depends on the player. It depends on your hand. My hand is really small, so you have to experiment with this. But I think it's a great skill to have. Here is a bonus for those of you who made it this far in the video. Thank you for watching. And that is here before you play. If you can't imagine what the target note is supposed to sound like, then all of the concepts that I mentioned in the video earlier, they kind of become useless. Before you execute a large shift, sing the note that you are heading to and that will greatly improve your chances. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Let me know your biggest takeaway in the comments section below and share this video with a friend or a colleague. If you have not already done so, go ahead and grab your free practice template PDF in the description below. And upon doing so, you will receive uh, access to my latest blogs and videos twice a month and the ability to reach me directly. Till next time, happy practicing.